Argument 1. The Holy Spirit Came on Sunday Some people maintain that according to Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was given to the church on the day of Pentecost, which fell on a Sunday. And this event, they say, affirms the sacredness of Sunday. According to Leviticus 23, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Fifty Days, always fell on a Sunday. The countdown to Pentecost began on the first Sunday after Passover week ended. The Jews celebrated the 50th day after seven full weeks of 49 days had passed. This means they observed the Feast of Pentecost on Sunday for more than 1,400 years before the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost in AD 30. Does the manifestation of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in AD 30 suddenly affirm the sacredness of Sunday? If so, why is the Creator totally silent about this transition? Thousands of people attended the Feast of Pentecost in AD 30, and they spoke many languages because they came from many nations. All of them were Jews and observed the Seventh-day Sabbath. So why does the Bible say nothing about the sacredness of Sunday if Sunday suddenly became a holy day? Sometime after the manifestation of the Holy Spirit at the Feast of Pentecost, some time after the manifestation of the Holy Spirit at the Feast of Pentecost, God sent Peter to the home of a Gentile named Cornelius, Acts 10, 44-47. After Cornelius heard the gospel of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon him and his family in the same way that it had come upon the disciples at Pentecost, Acts 15, 7-11. Again, the Bible says nothing in Acts 10 about the sacredness of Sunday or that the fourth commandment had been abolished. When Peter reported his visit to the church leaders a dozen years later, he said nothing about making Sunday a sacred day when he described the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost or in the home of Cornelius, Acts 15. After Peter's meeting with Cornelius, Paul met twelve men at Ephesus who had been baptized but had not received the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul laid hands on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, Acts 19, verses 1 through 7, just as the disciples did at Pentecost. The Bible records nothing in Acts 19 about the sacredness of Sunday or the fourth commandment being terminated. In fact, the Bible says in the following verses, Acts 19, 8 through 12, that Paul boldly went into the synagogue for three months to preach on the kingdom of God. And when the Jews would not tolerate his teachings, he moved to the lecture halls of Tyrannius, where he met daily with the people for two years. Paul said nothing about Sunday being a holy day for two years. There is only one way that this is possible. Paul had no idea that Sunday was a sacred day. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem at Pentecost in the house of Cornelius or in Ephesus did not terminate the fourth commandment. The Ten Commandments cannot be abolished without a plain Thus saith the Creator. And there is no such statement in the New Testament. The fourth commandment cannot be separated from the other nine. They come as a package of ten promises. They are a covenant, and all ten promises are kept in the Ark of His Covenant. Twenty-five years after Jesus ascended to heaven, James wrote this, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. James 2, 10 and 11. James would not have referred to two of the Ten Commandments 
if they had been nailed to the cross a quarter of a century earlier. James would not speak of the whole law if some of the commandments were no longer obligatory. So argument one does not support the sacredness of Sunday. Argument two. Three thousand people were baptized on Sunday. The Bible indicates that about three thousand people were baptized at the Feast of Pentecost in AD 30, Acts 2.41. For some people, these baptisms affirm that Sunday was sacred. They reasoned that on the day of Pentecost, the New Testament church gave the first message, Acts 2.14, the first converts were added to the church, and the first baptism of believers occurred, Acts 2.37. All of these firsts were wonderful, but wonderful things do not affect the fourth commandment. If God himself declares a specific day holy, only he can annul or change its holiness. A baptism or a wedding on a Sunday, Tuesday, or Wednesday does not make it a holy day. Jesus suffered and died on Friday, but that does not make Friday a holy day. A prayer meeting on Wednesday or an agape feast on Friday night do not make these days holy. Even if John the Baptist baptized Jesus on a Sunday, this would not make Sunday holy. As far as we can tell, John the Baptist baptized people every day of the week, Mark 1. Argument 2 fails because the Creator has said nothing that suggests or indicates that a day becomes holy because people are baptized on it. Argument 3. Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. Some Christians claim Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week makes Sunday a holy day. God would not unravel the fourth commandment and transfer the holiness of the seventh day to the first day without telling Sabbath-keeping believers about it. This claim has no scriptural support. Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene early on Sunday morning, John 20, verse 1. Then he ascended to the Father, John 20, verse 17, and drove Lucifer out of heaven, Revelation 12, 7 through 9. That afternoon, Jesus returned to earth and joined two disciples as they were walking back to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13 through 31. After this, he appeared to the disciples who were meeting in a secure place, hiding from the Jews. John 20, verse 19. Later on, Jesus also appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. John 21, 1. On one occasion after his resurrection, Jesus appeared before a crowd of over 500 people. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Given the exposure that Jesus had during the 40 days he was on earth after his resurrection, why did he say nothing about the sacredness of Sunday? This silence is puzzling because we know that his followers were 99.9% .9 Jewish. If the Ten Commandments had been nailed to the cross when Jesus died, surely something as dramatic as abolishing the Sabbath and making Sunday a holy day was discussed. There is no discussion in the Bible. Consider the Sunday afternoon that Jesus walked to Emmaus with his disciples. Luke 24, 13 indicates the distance between Jerusalem and Emmaus was seven miles. According to the Bible, they arrived in Emmaus as the day was nearly over. Luke 24, 29. And when they were about to eat, the disciples discovered that it was Jesus who had walked with them. However, before they could begin to eat, Jesus disappeared, and they became so excited that they returned to Jerusalem that same evening, arriving after dark to tell the rest of the disciples that they had actually seen Jesus. Luke 24, 33. Luke's account suggests that Jesus and his disciples did not regard Sunday as a holy day,
because they would not have walked seven miles if it was considered a holy day. According to Acts 1.12, the Jews believed a Sabbath day's walk could be no more than two miles, the distance from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. Moreover, Jesus did not clear Resurrection Sunday would be a holy day before he was crucified, and a few hours after his resurrection, he did not say anything about it on the road to Emmaus. Why would there be total silence on such a profound change if indeed such a change had occurred? Can you imagine observing Sunday as a holy day all of your life and suddenly switching to Saturday without any discussion or questions? On Thursday, three days before walking with his disciples to Emmaus, Jesus and his disciples sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples were anxious to know about the end of the world, Matthew 24, 3. And responding to their concerns, Jesus gave two prophecies. The first prophecy pertained to the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem, which was about 40 years away in AD 70 and the second prophecy pertained to the end of the world. Speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus said, Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Matthew 24, 20 If Jesus, the creator of the Sabbath, foreknew that its sacredness would be transferred to Sunday in a mere three days, he would not have encouraged his disciples to pray that they would not have to travel 40 years later on the Sabbath. Finally, if God declared a transition from Sabbath to Sunday during the first century AD, the New Testament would have had much to say about it. We know that Jesus chose Paul, one man speaking with one voice, to extract Christianity from the cradle of Judaism. As a Pharisee, Paul was highly educated in the economy of Judaism. After Paul's conversion, Jesus revealed many things to Paul that would otherwise be unknown. Armed with both his earthly and heavenly education, Paul faced an enormous amount of controversy during the years of his ministry. His main problem with the Jews was getting them to understand that salvation comes through faith instead of legalism. He wrestled with Jewish converts constantly over conflicts such as circumcision, Acts 15, 1 and 2, eating food offered to idols, Acts 15, 20 and verse 29, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, and the observance of feast days. Many Christians today are confused about observing the feast days that God gave to ancient Israel. Some people advocate the idea that Christians should observe the feasts. For example, they will often use Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 5.8 to justify observing Passover. Paul wrote, Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. If we interpret Paul's comments to mean that Christians should keep the festival of Passover, then Paul's theology becomes internally conflicted. This would force Paul into saying one thing in one place and then canceling it by making a contrary statement in another. We would not know which of Paul's statements to believe. Peter wrote that Paul's writings can be difficult to understand, and many people distort them to their own destruction, 2 Peter 3.16. For us to understand Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 5 about keeping the festival of Passover, we first have to understand Paul's attitude and behavior. He wrote, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win to Christ as many as possible. To the Jews I become like a Jew, to win the Jews. And those under the law I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, 
I became like one not having the law, although I am not free from God's law, the Ten Commandments. But I am under Christ's law, which says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 13, 34 and 35 So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I may save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23 When he was among Jews, Paul was willing to go along with Jewish customs, even though he previously was in bondage to them. Philippians 3, 4-7 but through Christ he had become free of them, Acts 21, 21 to, through 40. When Paul was among Gentiles who ate food offered to idols, he also ate food offered to idols because he knew that an idol was nothing, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 7. His flip-flop behavior deeply offended the Jews, especially those who wanted to diminish or abolish his gospel. After Paul was converted, he spent three years in the desert, Galatians 1, 17-18. While there, Jesus revealed many things to him that could not otherwise be known. Ephesians 3, 1-6, 2 Corinthians 12, 1-9. Jesus explained to Paul that the Father had abolished the Levitical system. That is, God abolished the drama he originally gave Israel with all of its ceremonial services and nailed it to the cross. These revelations explain how and why Paul could say to the Jews who wanted to become Christians, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath days. These are shadows of things that were to come, and the reality, however, is found in Christ. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 It was very difficult for Jewish converts, steeped in the intricate traditions of Judaism, to let their cherished customs go when uniting with the church that Jesus established. The Bible provides a good example of, which occurred about 15 years after Jesus ascended to heaven. When Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain leading men came from Jerusalem, sent by James, the president of the newly formed Christian church, he, Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived from Jerusalem, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Many early Christian converts insisted that all believers in Christ must be circumcised in order to be saved. Acts 15, 1 and 2 The other Jews who lived in Antioch joined him. Peter, in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Paul's partner bon Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not eating in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you have freedom through Christ to live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you suddenly force these Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and proud of it, and not the poor lowly Gentile sinners, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we proud Jews, too, have been scolded we must put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the Levitical law. Because by observing the law, any law, no one will be justified. Galatians 2, 11 through 16 Paul knew the ceremonial system. Animal sacrifices, new moon feasts, the annual feasts, 
Sabbaths, were shadows of things that pointed to Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection. After Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and ascended to the Father, the Father abolished the ceremonial system. Therefore, when Paul was among the Jews, he went along with their religious traditions to win them to Christ, because the ceremonies were no longer meant anything to him. When Paul was among the Gentiles, he ate food offered to idols in order to win them to Christ, because the idol is nothing, and the food meant nothing. If you consider the context in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul actually scolds the church at Corinth for trying to remain Jewish and for keeping the festival. His words are often removed from their context so that he appears to endorse the very practice he is discouraging. He said, Your earlier boasting, 1 Corinthians 4.18, is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast, yeast was prohibited during the Feast of Unleavened Bread because yeast represented sin, works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast in your hearts, that you may become a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So what are you now celebrating? The reason for observing the feast is behind us. It has been fulfilled. Therefore, let us keep the spirit of the festival alive in our hearts, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5, 6-8 through 8. Paul used a metaphor to say, If you insist on keeping the Passover, it is foolish because our Passover lamb, that is, the Passover lamb of believers in Jesus, has been sacrificed. Therefore, observe and keep the true meaning of the festival by living a life that is pleasing and acceptable to Jesus, by eating the bread of sincerity and truth. The biblical truth that eliminates the observation of the feast post-Calvary is simple. One cannot observe the feast without first meeting the specifications required for the feast by Levitical laws. After Paul understood that the Father had appointed Jesus, from the tribe of Judah, as the high priest of sinners, the Levitical law had to be abolished. For when there is a change of priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Hebrews 7.12 Contrary to what most Christian scholars say, the context of Galatians 4.10-13, Colossians 2.16, and Romans 14, 5 and 6, does not concern the fourth commandment or the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath. The issue is the observance of feast days. Israel's feast days fell throughout the week and were also called Sabbaths, Leviticus 16, 31, because God forbade Israel from working on them. When a feast day and the seventh day occurred on the same day, it was called a high Sabbath or a special Sabbath, John 19, 31. Finally, there is no mention of any controversy concerning the sacredness of Sunday in the New Testament. This silence indicates that what, there was no controversy during the first century because most, if not all, of the New Testament was written in the last half of the first century. These points add up to only one conclusion. Jesus' resurrection on Sunday did not change or abolish the holiness of the seventh day. So, argument three does not establish the sacredness of Sunday.